Well, good morning, Venture. Good morning. morning to those watching in the classic service, those who are watching online. And uh, we're gonna take a moment, just pray before we jump into the message. One, we are pray about the topic. Pray for our openness, pray for God to speak through it. I wanna pray because this is a really big week. It's a big week in our country, big week in our community because coming up this week on uh, November the 8th, we have family movie night. <laughs> and and uh, l- let me say, it's actually Friday night. So it's Friday, November 8th. If you're coming to family mo- movie night, you wanna bring some friends. We're showing Home Alone. We've uh, edited out some of the you know, gratuitous language. I don't know why they threw it in family movies back then, but they did. Uh, so we've got an edited version of uh, Home Alone on Friday night. Be a nice, great way for you to bring your neighbors and friends. Love for you to be a part. There's, there's also an event happening on Tuesday. Uh, and it is important. And uh, I, I really seriously want to ask all of us, could we do three things this week? One, I would ask all of us, will you pray? Please pray. Pray for our country. Pray for the elections. We, we, we are the ones who have an open audience with the one who's actually in charge. And he responds to our prayers. So let's pray, pray this week. The second thing I would ask you to do, would you vote? Vote, as Christians, we steward that power. And we have to give an account to God how we steward it. And so as good stewards who wanna see the best for our community, Christians always wanna impact their communities, their cities for its good. And one of the ways you can do that is vote. And and you may be saying, well, Tim, I don't know who to vote for in that. Here's what I'd encourage you to do. Look around you. If you really don't know who to vote for, look around you. If there's somebody you really respect how they they operate all of their life, go ask them their opinion. That's part of wisdom. We're talking about wisdom. Wise people go ask wise people for opinion. I've got some people in the body I really look to because they stay so informed in that. And so I really value what they say, maybe more than they realize with it. And uh, it it helps with it. So ask somebody, but when you ask them, do this. You're not allowed to go ask them. And if they tell you, you can't go, you're voting for them. You're you're asking not as an investigative journalist. You're asking because you really want to know why they think that way. And collect some wisdom. But go vote. Let's be good stewards of what God's given us. And then the last thing I would ask you to do this week, on Wednesday morning... No matter how the elections turned out, if we know by Wednesday morning, could we be the most hopeful people out there? Shouldn't Christians be hopeful? Even if if you wake up and you're disappointed, you wake up and you're delighted. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And so we're hopeful regardless. In fact, I'd want you to be so hopeful this week that as Peter said, somebody would ask you, hey, can you tell me why you're so hopeful? And you could tell them about the foundation of your hope. That's Jesus, no matter what happens in it. Can we take a moment? Let's just pray together. Father, we do come before you. We, we lift up this election. We thank you for the privilege in this country to be able to vote. I, I pray as your church, as people, would we steward well? Would you lead our hearts? Would we look to you? Would we ask you? Would we seek wise counsel? And then to the best of our ability, use this for your glory. Lord, I, I pray that we would be the voice of hope, not just this week, but this whole season to come. In a world that's filled with so much fear, in a world that's filled with so much anger, could we be the people who point with the hope that we have in Jesus Christ? Lord, I I pray today as we jump into your word, as we talk about a topic that impacts all of us more than we even realize. Lord, I pray for grace. I pray for truth. I pray that we would be people that look to you and listen to you. Lord, would you drown out the lies that uh, the evil one is gonna wanna flood hearts and minds with even now? Lord, could we come and we know we're people who can step into the light because you're in the light. We can have fellowship with you and each other. 
that in your grace we can talk about and think about and confess anything and know that our hope is found in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, as Chuck said this morning, we're continuing our series on foolproofing your life. And in it, we're gonna wrestle with the whole topic of sexual foolishness. And, and I know, even as I say that, I'm swimming upstream. You know, there's some weeks when, you know, it's like a home game. You know, when a team has a home game, you know, the crowd's with you all the time. There, I mean, everybody's there, you, you got the roar of it. And then there's away games. And away games, you might not have the crowd. And, and the reality, when you talk about just sex in general, and we even defining what is sexual foolishness, if you just look at the current numbers, the way things are moving, man, you're really swimming upstream if you're presenting what I would call a biblical sexual ethic in that. I mean, the, the latest numbers I, I was reading even this week is about, it's about 70% of people in our culture today cohabitate before they marry. They decide to live together first out of it. About 90% say they have sex before marriage. That's culture at large. Among Christians, those who claim Christianity, about 70% argue that sex before marriage is permissible in a committed relationship. And, and you're seeing massive jumps in these things, by the way. About 50% of people who would claim Christianity would say casual sex is okay as well. And, and, and so as I look at that and you start reading the numbers, you go, whew, okay, we're, we're gonna present this whole topic and, and talk about what is wisdom and what is foolishness in it and how it impacts. And recognize that some of you here, maybe you're early in your journey. You go, I'm, I'm not even sure I believe in Christianity. There'll be a part of this that feels very, it's countercultural. It is to the world today. Um, th there's many here that you go, I, I'm, I'm Christian, I, I just, man, I don't know. It just feels like the church has made too much of sex. And so you've kind of buckled up and go, okay, I know what's coming out of that. I, I would just call all of us, especially in a topic when we're talking about what's wise and what's foolish, what's the impact of it, what's the end result, would there be just at least an openness to maybe engage it at a level and to think about it? And, and I say that because of everything that we've been looking at in Proverbs, this whole contrast between wisdom and foolishness. Remember the, one of the key things, foolishness always feels right to the fool. It always feels right to him. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. And, and I think this is one of the, the core issues, especially when you talk about something like sex that runs so deeply, there's a part of it that we kind of put up our walls because it's like, I, I'm gonna do what feels right to me. And, and you may be right, but you also may be a fool if that's your only determining factor. You look at it, it says, there's, there's a way that seems right to a man, to a person, but its end is the way to death. Now again, he's not saying here, oh man, you do the wrong thing, God will smite you. And sometimes that's how the church is presented, like man, you mess up sexually, God, I mean, if there's anything he loves to jump on people about, it's their sex lives and what they did wrong. That's not what the writer's saying here. The writer's saying though, in all of life, there's a way that kind of feels natural to you, but you need to look at the, what, what is the end result of it? And the death he talks about is not just the death, like I died physically, I was, God smote me right in the moment. What he's talking about though is, do you not experience life as he designed it? Death can happen over a long time. It can happen in relationships. It can happen in personal identity and fulfillment. Death shows up in a lot of ways. And, and if you step back on it, even if I took Christianity totally out of it and just asked you to go to the table and really research, and I really would encourage you, if, if you're somebody, you go, I'm not sure about Christianity. If you just researched it sociologically, you researched satisfaction pat patterns, you research what's happening in it. Th this trajectory we're on of what's happening with sex. Even down, you take it to the most explicit level of you know, somebody on Tinder and they're using sex just for a self-fulfillment. Is not leading 
to a place of fulfillment that you think it would if you just follow it that way. That's why I think it's just important as Christians, and, and I'm gonna be preaching to those who would say they're Christians, those who would align their lives under the Bible, what does the Bible say about sexual wisdom and sexual foolishness? And what does Proverbs say about it? To do that, we gotta step back a little bit though and just establish what does the Bible say about sexual wisdom? And so I, I thought it'd be important to, to recognize wisdom in any area of life always starts with God. It always starts with God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so what the writer of, of Proverbs is saying, in any area of your life, what you believe about God is gonna shape everything that you do. And I would say this is more true about your sexual life than really any other area. What you actually believe about God is actually gonna show up in how you practice this. And, and the, the writer's saying, hey, if, if you really step back and you develop this healthy sense of who God is and, and what he's called us to, what he's actually said, it probably is gonna shape your decision-making in that. To do that, what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says God designed sex for a man and woman in the covenant of marriage. And, and as, as I got into this message, I realized we probably need a whole sermon series around sex. I know I did one a couple of years ago and we talked about some of the issues of the culture of our day. You know, what's the Bible say about homosexuality and transgenderism and some of those, we, we hit some of those trouble spots. I, I, I realized as I was preparing for this, we probably just need to step back and have a, you know, a whole sermon series. What does it say? Because it's such an important topic to it. And, and I'm gonna cover this section right here. We'll have to cover pretty quickly. Each of them could be sermons in parts. But I think it's important to recognize the Bible has defined sex and, and the definition of it is this covenant. So there's a commitment that you're making as a man and a woman in marriage. Now again, a lot of you right there, you might go, well, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, again, just hear me out. For those of us who are saying, I want the Bible to shape my life, felt like I at least need to make a, a presentation of what does the Bible say about that? The, the core thing that you see about marriage, these are the verses, it goes all the way back to the very beginning. It's Adam and Eve in the garden. When God designed human beings, the man said, when Eve is presented to him, after he's seen all these other animals, Adam looks at her and he says, now this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. Uh, the Hebrew here, it, it's really, he's really excited when he sees her. English loses something here, kind of loses that. He's like, finally, this is what I've been looking for. And, and then God makes this definition. That is why a man leaves his father and mother, is united. He's bonded with his wife. They shall become one flesh. And, and a key part of that one flesh is the sexual part of it. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. There's this expression, and it's saying that, that that's a full part of that expression. It's not shameful, it's embraced with it. They are naked. Uh, growing up in the South, we would pronounce it naked. They were naked. In fact, I said it once in a message. I said, you know, they were naked and had this woman, her husband came up afterwards. She was like very offended almost. She said, Tim, the word is naked, <laughs> not naked. And I looked at her and said, well, man, the way you say it, Naked is what you get in the doctor's office. <laughs> Naked is what you get in the bedroom. <laughs> he smiled, she didn't, but uh, with that. But, but there's this, this celebration of it. It's looking at this definition of it. And in fact, as you read through the Bible, the reason I go back to this verse, this is the one that's pointed to over and over again. When I hear people that go, well, Jesus didn't care about sex. No, this is the verse Jesus went back to. This is the one he quoted and said, oh no, God's already designed it. This is what it's supposed to be. I'll hear people that say, yeah, but if you read through the Bible, I mean, you see every form of sexual expression. You see people and there's polygamists and people that have affairs and people do all these things. So God must not be too worried about it. I mean, if you just looked at the stories of it. And again, I always wanna tell them, go back and look at the story. Here's the one thing you will see all the way throughout the Bible. It's what I love about Christianity and the Bible, by the way, it's really honest. It's honest about the failures, even of its heroes. Every one of the stories 
when the people do any form of sexual expression other than what God designed, it always leads to problems. It always leads to heartache. That's what it's teaching us. See, the Bible has this consistent theme all the way through when it comes to sex, that there's, there's a lot of broken people who've made mistakes. And then there's the other consistent theme is God's grace is extended no matter what the mistake is. He's there to heal and pick up pieces. But he's also a God that said, hey, what if you didn't have to make the mistake? What if you didn't have to go through the heartache? What if you actually went according to the design? And so when you, you look to the Bible, we'd want to understand what are his purposes for that? Let me give you five purposes that we see in sex. You, you may come up with more in that and each of these can be developed, but five purposes that he designed for sex. The first one is procreation. He commanded Adam and he filled the earth. This is how he determined how we make babies. It's one of the key terms that we use with that. It's procreation. Now, there's a problem you're gonna see on any of these purposes. One of the problems is, is when you say that's the only purpose or that's the preeminent purpose at all, at all points. And I haven't put these in order of preeminence with that. I think they all go together in that. And so there was a, a time period when, when you know, the church almost treated sex like it was this dirty thing that you had to do in order to have children. And so it's only good you know, if you're for procreation, but for no other means with that. I don't think that's an accurate picture of sex as we're gonna see in scripture with that. Why? Because one of the other things is pleasure, to create enjoyment. And, and you see that in scripture that God designed it that way. He didn't have to. And again, there's times in the church period, especially huge times when, when the Roman Catholic church kind of determined a lot of it and priesthood and you had people that really were uncomfortable even with the concepts around sex, much less pleasure in sex. And, and so you, you, you look at it when the church kind of wanted to go, well, it's procreation and uh, you know, this, no. And, and yet you look at it and go, guys, what do you do with the book of Song of Solomon? I mean, read Song of Solomon. Like the background song going on would be, let's get it on. I mean, that's the whole book. <laughs> it's this celebration of sexual expression for both the man and the woman, by the way. It's a full celebration. That's part of what the church had trouble with is a, a woman's sexuality as well. And so, so some of the things that are written against it, are, and you'll read at times that, you know, some treat Sagama Solomon is so, only an allegory between Jesus and his church. There, there may be that part because we know Christ loves his church. But, but you're hard pressed to read through the book without realizing that God gave the gift of sex, there's pleasure that's involved in it. Now, now here's the flip side of it though. Our culture wants to kind of reduce sex to just pleasure. And that's kind of what you hear. It's, oh, Tim, it's just, it's fun, it feels good, it doesn't really matter. It's just physical. It's not anything else. And yet I would ask, do, do you really believe that? Do people really believe it's, and a couple of questions I ask around that. Why is it that sexual trauma has such profound effects that go well beyond the physical? That impact a person's identity, sometimes for a lifetime. Because I think it's more than physical. Or, or take trauma out of it. Why is it that sexual shame I mean, weighs down on people like few other things? In fact, as a pastor over the years, I can, I can almost guarantee if I have somebody that they're talking to me and they're in the office and they say, they say these words, hey, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone. Almost always is something sexual. What is it about that sin or issue that, that weighs so hard that I, I can't tell anybody else. I mean, if it's just physical. But see, I think our souls know, our bodies know. We know it's more. 
It certainly is physical. It certainly is pleasurable, but don't reduce it to that alone. I think that's part of the big struggle we're having with it now. We just want to reduce it to that. See, the third part of it, it was designed for passion to increase intimacy. Intimacy between the couple of, of not just two bodies coming together, but two lives coming together. They bond as one. It's this, this miracle, this mystery that sex is an expression of it, but it's a total expression of life. And it totally changes things when I'm actually intimate with the person and committed to a person and it's self-giving and is vulnerable in that. And sex is now about what I give to them, not what I take to them from them. And it becomes the extension of the whole relationship because I have to look at the whole relationship is, am I in a giving relationship or am I just always the taker? And I take and I take and I take and and people who are takers are surprised when they suddenly come to the bedroom and the other person gets tired of giving because all you do is take. See, it was designed to promote intimacy. It's designed to promote bonding in it. This is one of the problems in a culture that's reduced it just to pleasure. And, and so they've used it for pleasure, whether it's with a person, whether it's with pornography, with their, all those things. And then those, some of those same people, when they come into a real passion relationship, when they want to be intimate with a real person, they start struggling with it. They start struggling with, how do I even do this? I, I, I give you evidence of this. Have you noticed the commercials for erectile dysfunction medicine? It used to be targeted toward people my age and above, like older people, and it was helpful medicine, physical, it's it's very helpful in that, great discovery with it. But you remember the commercials used to be a bunch of people kind of with gray hair and couples smiling at each other and they're kind of looking at each other, it's, you know, it's blue pill night tonight, woo! You know, they're smiling out of that. Here's what I challenge you, look at the commercials now. It's all young people. Because that's the growing audience for that medicine. About 25% and it keeps going up every year is prescribed to people in their 20s, early 30s. You go, wait, they're not old enough to have those same physical problems old people had. No, it's, it's not a physical problem, it's a rewiring of the brain that I've I've just turned it into this pleasure thing. And now my brain can't really respond when I want to have an intimate relationship with a real human being. And and it's just science. People go, oh man, why are you putting morality on? I'm just telling you the science of it. You look at the fourth category, it was designed for permanence to actually strengthen the bond. That's why when, when you have sex, there's a release. That's why all these neurochemicals are involved in it that you, you look at it. That's, that's why there's dopamine and, and make sure serotonin and one of the key ones, oxytocin. Oxytocin is a bonding chemical. It's one of the bonding chemicals that's released between a mother and child. There's a bonding chemical. It was designed to create the kind of permanence that God designed sex for. But what happens though, when you're using that all the time on what should be a bonding with a person and I'm bonding everywhere. And you go, oh, Tim, you're not really bonding. It's interesting in in Corinth, when Paul wrote the book of Corinthians, he's writing a very countercultural sexual culture. I mean, the Christian message in Corinth, if you think it kind of cuts across today, when, when the church in Corinth, they're hearing it, they're like, wait, what? That's what it looks like to follow Jesus in this area of our life because it it just was the sexual wild, wild west. And so Paul has to address things in the church. He goes, hey guys, you can't do this. Hey guys, this is why this is so important out of it. And and in Corinth, probably the cheapest form of sex, if you go to Corinth, there's this acrocorinth, there's this temple that was up there. And and if so, if you really wanted a cheap expression of sex, you went up to one of the temples and you paid a temple prostitute. And nobody in the, the city thought twice about it. It'd be like using porn today. It's like, oh no, I mean, you're just paying her. It's transactional. Nobody thinks that or you're paying him. I mean, it's all, all different forms of it, but no one thought about it. Even to the point when Paul's writing in the church, he's having to tell the church guy, people, man, you can't do that. And they hear it and they go, oh, Paul. I mean, 
I mean, a prostitute, there's no, you're not doing, he says, no. Look what he says in this. He says, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute, you're one with her body. You're, you're creating the oneness that he described all the way back in Genesis. For he said, the two will become one flesh. I mean, as much as you want to make it transactional, you just want to make it a sexual experience. It's bigger than that. That, that's why it has the impact that it does. That's why, have you ever seen a couple that you go, why do they stay together longer than they should? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about a married couple. You have a couple that's dating and, and they know it's a train wreck. They not, know it's not going anywhere. You, you ever seen that? Young people, you see it and you go, yeah. Usually there's a sexual bond that's been created so it makes breaking up that much harder. Why, why do you see somebody and they, they like are so blinded they're blinded by how bad this person is for them in their life. A lot of times they get blinded by sex. See, part of God's protection for you as, as a single adult, especially, God's protection is not, oh, I'm down on sex and how dare you. He is very up on sex. He designed it, by the way. But he wants to protect you. And, and in his design, he said, this is how it's the best experience. This is how you protect yourself from getting in the wrong relationship. This is how you protect yourself from rewiring your brain in ways that really is gonna have impact down the line. He actually loves you enough that he's willing to go, hey, I'll draw some hard boundaries because I know how it really works. The last category of it is priority. It's to refine our lives. It, it's, it's one of the key areas where you can really determine what your priorities are. And, and, and for everyone who says, oh man, God is first, God is first, God is first, is he? Is he in this area? And, and again, some people that go, hey, it's Tim, again, that's, you're, you're putting morality around it. Jesus was just about love. Christianity should just be about love. As long as you love, you're, you're okay with it. I, I would go, yeah, Jesus said, if you want to define all of Christianity, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus said, if you, if you want to get it down to a core, man, do you love God enough that you let him have all? And, and I think sex is one of the areas that you really can look at your life and go, Man, is God in the place of priority? I say he is. And there's a refining that happens in that. There's a biblical wisdom around sex. Now, now again, if you don't believe the Bible, you don't believe in God, uh, uh, of course you're gonna come at it a different way. But if you're here and you go, yeah, I'm really trying to understand why would God say this? And how do I avoid, and specifically in Proverbs, how do I avoid foolishness around it? And, and if you, you really want to avoid foolishness, maybe you struggle with it. I really would encourage you, Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, all three chapters have lengthy sections that really are warning around sexual foolishness. It gives stories in that. And, and in fact, I just in the time that we have remaining, I just want to turn our attention to how, how do we avoid it? How do we do that? How, how do we, if I want to live according to the ethic that was just said, for the reasons just said, how would I turn toward it? Let me just give you some practical ways according to Proverbs. Look in Proverbs 7. The writer says, at the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple, I noticed the young men, a youth who had no sense. It's another way of saying somebody who's foolish. Look what this young person does. He was going down the street near her corner. He was walking along in the direction of her house at twilight as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. So the first thing he's looking at, he's looking at this young man. You're gonna read in Proverbs, it's written to young men. Part of the reason was young women didn't have sexual agency. They, they didn't have the power to make poor decisions in a lot of cases that they do today. And so if he's writing it today, he'd write it to young men and young women because both of you have the ability to choose and, and express in that way. As he writes it, look, look what he's noticing the first thing. He says, before he ever gets anything else, I mean, the guy is setting himself up for problems. And so, so the first thing I, I would just say as warning, don't put yourself in the wrong context to be tempted. He's looking at it and he goes, why are you going down that street? Why are you going this time of day? It's 
It's about to get dark, huh? You know what you're doing. I would say purity is often based on proximity. Where you place yourself can protect you in a lot of ways. And, and sometimes, you know, I'll hear from a young couple and they go, Tim, I know that. I mean, we weren't planning on it, but we're just so in love and we just couldn't help ourselves. And, and I get it. If you're in love and you're on a trajectory toward a marriage relationship, of course you're going to desire each other. That's how God designed it. That's a good thing that you actually desire. But, but, but I'm hearing this is like, oh, we couldn't help it. I, here's how I don't believe that. And here's what I'd say. In 35 years of being a pastor, I've never once in any church service ever looked over and there's a couple that they're just making out. <laughs> that if I went over to them, they go, oh, pastor, you just got to understand we're so in love. We just couldn't help it. Now, why? Why are they not? Because this is the wrong place. There's people around. See, the, the, the same is true. If, if you're constantly alone in one of your apartments or place, if you're constantly in a car alone, if you're constantly putting yourself in a context, if you're constantly on your computer alone at the wrong times of night, if you constantly get up and get on your phone, if, if, there, there's a, a key part of it. He, he, he's just saying in this, don't go down that street. The key of it is, here, here's the key, while you're thinking rationally, while you're thinking with wisdom, you try to put some barriers in place, you try to put new strategy in place when you're not gonna be thinking that way. And you know the difference between the two. That's part of wisdom. The second thing, look at this. Then out came the woman to meet him. She was dressed like a prostitute with crafty intent. She's unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay home. Now in the street, now in the square, every corner she lurks. So there's, and, and this woman is not just one woman. It's, it's representing sexual temptation. It could be a woman or a man, but it's saying it's everywhere. There's sexual temptation that's out there. She took hold of him. She kissed him with a brazen face. She said, today I've fulfilled my vows. I have food from my fellowship offering at home. So I came out to meet you. I looked for you and I have found you. Now notice this. Today I fulfilled my vows. She's a good church girl. Oh, I went to temple, I did my vows. I've done church. I was good, now let's be bad. And then I'll go next week and I'll go to church again and I'll fulfill my vows and we'll, we'll make it all right. But you know, we gotta live. And I was looking for you. I've covered my bed with linens from Egypt. She set the whole thing up. I've perfumed the myrrh. These are all very sexual terms within that time period. You'd go, Whoa. She said, come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves. My husband's not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took a purse full of money. He's gonna be gone a long time. No, he won't be home till the full moon. I mean, really, he's not a good husband leaving me that long. It's really his fault. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She did, seduced him with smooth talk. And you feel it? You hear it? She, you look at this. Here's what the writer's telling us. Be on guard on the different areas of your life that lead to sexual foolishness. You read through this passage, there wasn't just one thing in it. And I, I would just encourage you, guard your eyes. Guard what you're looking at. She came out dressed for it. He said she came out dressed like a prostitute in it. She came out in a way that, man, when he saw her, he knew what the intent was. He enjoyed looking at her. And I would just say on this topic real quick, on just the whole issue of modesty, um, I, I would encourage you as a young, young woman, uh, let me be real clear, because there, there was a time period of modesty culture that we shamed women for even having bodies. We don't want to go back there. Um, or we put it all on the woman. Like, man, if he looked and he lusted, it was your fault. No, it's not, it's his fault. Jesus said that. Jesus said, you're responsible for your eyes. And so guys, regardless of what she's wearing or what's out there, it's still your choice, your fault. And, and the hard part about it is they can almost be wearing anything. And if you really are in a lustful mindset, you, you can get your brain to go there. I would encourage you as women, you're not responsible for his thought life, but you are responsible as sisters in Christ that you actually care about him. 
And I would just say this to you, you know when you're dressing in a way that you're trying to get sexual attention. And that has nothing to do with him. You may be trying to fulfill a whole other need in your life with it. And so part of it is just thinking about all of these things with it. Flip side of it is you got to make a choice with your own eyes. All of us, you have to make a choice with your eyes. And that may be having an accountability partner or something like covenant eyes or something that's out there. Maybe inviting somebody in. One of the ministries I love here at our church, we've, we've got a ministry, Warrior Men, of men who've said, you know what, I'm tired of porn and other things so dominating my life. It's a confidential ministry, but man, we, we have hundreds of guys that have experienced life and freedom because they were willing to get honest with it. They have journey women for women whose husbands have been caught up and you go, man, I need some support. There's beloved ministry for women. One of the highest growing areas of porn use is women. And so, so just being honest enough, I, I put in your notes, the website, the email for those, if, you, if that's something that you go, yeah, I would want that. You guard your eyes, you guard your mind what you engage. She's persuasive, she's persuasive. And so she's talking them into it. And, and here's where I would encourage you. I think there's a cultural persuasion that's happening to the church when it comes to sex. When every show we see, and every song you hear, and that, and I'm not even talking about the explicit stuff, I'm just going culturally, every show, every movie, everything, that young people in that, they're just told dating people have sex no matter what. It's just, you need to realize that's cultural persuasion. It, it impacts you over time, it impacts your kids. And so having conversations with them directly of why we don't, of, of how the movie didn't show the whole story, then show what happens often in that. You guard your mind. You guard your heart. You guard your heart. This may be the key one. Because notice what she said to him. She said, I was looking for you. Man, I want you. Let, let's be honest. I mean, y'all, everybody wants to feel attractive. And some of you go, oh, Tim, I don't care how I look. Really? Okay, come here. I'm going to take some selfies with you. No, no, no. You don't get to pose. I get to set you up. Let's show all of your chins. Come on. Let's show all your chins. No, let's get sideways and get the full gut or the big butt or, you know, I mean, whatever it is. We're going we're gonna to do it. Yeah. Why do we pose just the right way and the right angle? Because we want to look decent. That's just normal to all of us. Maybe more than attraction. We want to be wanted. We all want somebody to want us. And some of the greatest vulnerability that people have in this area is sometimes you were wounded by somebody in the past. It could be a parent that you didn't feel wanted or a relationship. H hear me, if you don't wrestle with this, you're so vulnerable. See, that, that's one of the reasons I love Christianity. Because the God of the universe wants you to know he loves you. He wants you as you. And he can fill parts of your heart that no other person can. Is it this guarantee, oh, there's no sexual problem? No, but you'd be amazed when that part gets filled first. It protects you. It's what Proverbs says, you, you, you're able to guard your heart above everything else because everything flows out of that heart. Everything flows out of it. Look at the next part of it. At once he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. And all of these are the pictures, the animals he's chosen, it's strength, it's freedom. It's this beautiful animal that you see this picture and you go, oh, it's not the way it was supposed to be. And I'll just tell you, scripture teaches us there's always powerful consequences for sexual foolishness. There's always consequences, always, always. That's why Paul said, 
He said, run from it, flee from sexual immorality. All the other sins you commit are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually, they sin against their own body. That's why the trauma goes so deep. That's why the shame lasts. That's why the brain gets rewired in it. Because when, when you choose to be outside of the design, you can have other sins and yes, they're wrong, these sins, it's not that God looks at sexual sins and goes, oh, they're worse. He actually looks at it and goes, oh no, sex is so powerful, it's so good. But when you sin outside of the design, man, it impacts you. And, 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 and so he's given this good gift that impacts you. And so you have this gift of, of if I were able to come back from the future, and give you your own little personal nuclear reactor that you could have at your house. And you put garbage in. That's all you gotta do is put garbage in it. And it gives you 1.21 gigawatts of power. Now there's a little plutonium in it as well. And you go, whoo, Tim, isn't that dangerous? I go, it is, but if, if you'll just actually respect it and, and just follow the directions, you'll never have to pay an energy bill again. And at your home, what a gift to you. Now, if I came over later, about a month later, and I noticed you're leaving the lid open, I see a little plutonium coming out. Your kids are glowing in the dark now. <laughs> they go, what are you guys doing? You go, oh man, you had all these rules around it. We just kind of like to use it our way. I, I look at it and go, man, what a gift, real powerful gift. And, and if you'd actually respect it, oh, how wonderful it could be. But if you, if you try to do it a way different than the designer, there's always consequences. And so if you're married, I just tell you, invest in your sex life for the sake of your relationship with God and with each other. Invest in it, celebrate it. This Proverbs five passage, he says, drink water from your cisterns. You, don't, you shouldn't share it with anyone else. He says, may your fountain be blessed and you rejoice in the wife of your youth. You rejoice, you celebrate. It's the wife of your youth, not your young wife. So it's, it's the whole marriage. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Do you hear the phrase there? intoxicated. This is supposed to be fun. Sex was never just about making babies. I mean, this is making whoopee right here. And some of you young people you go, well, I've never heard that term. Well, the key, key part of it is whoopee. Yeah. I mean, it's intoxicated. My son, be, why would you be intoxicated with another wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? And, and I say this because some of you are godly people who are settling for a sexless marriage. And you've kind of convinced yourself, it's okay, we don't need it. I've rarely found both partners agree with that statement, by the way. And, and I know you may go, well, Tim, we, we have some physical issues. You may, I, I get that. I'm not saying it's got to look like everyone else. I am saying it's a part of your life. Tim, we have some baggage or some trauma. And I don't address that lightly, but I would hope you love your partner and God enough that you actually believe you could step into that and get some help with it. And, and if you're married, invest in it. Give some time and energy toward it. Young husbands, young husbands, who are probably going, preach it, Tim. <laughs> you want to invest in your sex life? Start doing the dishes more. <laughs> Help put the kids down. Be there during bath time. And here's the key. Don't just do it on the night you want sex. She's not an idiot, guys. Come on. It's a consistent investment in the relationship. Because remember, sex is about giving, not taking. Where are you showing the giving and the rest of it? If you're single, invest in your sex life by sacrificing now 
for something better later? What will you sacrifice now for something better later? Every great investment's that way, by the way. And, and I, I don't preach this message and go, oh, it's no sacrifice. It's huge sacrifice. And some of you, you are sacrificing at a level, huge level. But I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, every sacrifice before God always leads something better later. Now, it may be a sacrifice now that leads to a better sexual relationship later if God brings that to you in marriage. It may be a sacrifice that goes a long time because I, I, let's be honest, I, I've talked to a lot of single adults who chose to do it the right way and this led to tremendous sacrifice in their life. And the one thing I know, God loves to reward sacrifice. I promise he hasn't forgotten you. I promise. But it's worth the investment. And the final thing I'd just say for all, if you failed in this area, would you just embrace that God's grace is greater than your shame? And this is probably all of us in some way. And because sex is so powerful and sexual shame is so powerful, it can hang over. It can hang over Christians. I know Christians who in every year of their life, but the sexual shame of something in the past can just haunt them. And so one of the things you're going to have to believe is God's grace actually overcomes this. And I don't have to live under that. You know, one of my favorite verses is in Jeremiah. Where, where he's talking to the nation of Israel. And if you know anything about Israel at that time, God would often use sexual imagery to talk about the nation. And he says to the nation of Israel, man, you, you chased after other gods. You chased after a way. You committed spiritual adultery in it. It's part of the reason they were under judgment. But look how God describes his people. He said, the Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again. And look how he describes it. And you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up the timbrels and you'll go out and dance with the joyful. W would you believe that no matter what you've done, God loves you with an everlasting love. He has kindness towards you in this area. When's the last time somebody was just kind to you in the area you were most shameful about? God does. And he has a vision of what could be in the same way he looks at this unfaithful Israel and he goes, you know how I picture you? I picture you under my grace and under my forgiveness as virgin Israel. Of something new. The same could be true for you. But you have to believe him. In fact, if we could just take a moment, would you just bow your heads where you are? And, and there's no way to go through a message like this without it really tapping into a number of things for people. Maybe you're here today and you're wrestling with whether you just even believe this presentation about sex. This is new for you or outside of it. Would you just ask God what his opinion is? Would you just be open to him? Just say, God, I'm wrestling with this, but if this is what you've designed, would you show it to be true? For some of you here today, you've known this is true, but you, you haven't been living it. So maybe today you just need to lay it at his feet and actually believe he's a God of mercy and grace and kindness. That there's forgiveness. And receive it again.
For some, you need to take a next step. Maybe there's somebody you need to confess to. Maybe there's a relationship you need to stop. Maybe you need to email one of those ministries and take a next step and and go get some help or call a biblical life coach or speak to a pastor or a counselor. Right now, the Holy Spirit is impressing upon you a next step. Will you commit to God that you'll do it? And for all of us, I, I pray that we would just embrace grace in this moment that only comes from the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we come and we lift this before you. We want to be people who are wise in every area of our life. And in this area that is just so different from the rest of the culture, would you open our eyes? Would you open our hearts? Could we step into your grace and actually believe it? and experience the life change that you've called us to. And we pray this in Christ's name.